We got a lot of requests to go over the science on autoimmune disease and nutrition. So we finally did, and we found a lot, dozens and dozens of studies spanning at least the last four decades or so, looking at a lot of different diets from low fat to low carb, Mediterranean, paleo, fasting, and a lot of others. Since this is our first video on this topic, we'll give you a general sense of what research exists. Big picture. We're not gonna go over every single study that we analyzed. It'd be a 12 hour video, but we will give you the key takeaways that I would like to have if I had autoimmune disease or a family member or a loved one. We'll also look at the experiences some viewers report that may seem to be at odds with most of the evidence and we'll try to make sense of what's going on there. Autoimmune disease, as the name indicates, is a set of conditions where your immune system turns against your own body and attacks your own tissues. And depending on the specific tissue involved, the symptoms, the manifestations can vary. And in fact, there's many different types of autoimmune disease. Over a hundred have been described. Some common ones you might have heard of are rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. There are some treatments available, some medications have been developed, but they're not 100% effective. So a lot of patients still have some symptoms, quality of life is not 100%, and so there's a lot of interest in what else they can do, especially at the level of lifestyle, like nutrition, for example. And the evidence, as you're about to see, indicates that the foods we eat do play a significant role. So one example is a trial conducted in Sweden where patients with rheumatoid arthritis were split randomly and put on either a Mediterranean diet or a usual Swedish diet. Now, Mediterranean diet in nutrition science refers to the classic Mediterranean diet. So low and ultra processed foods, olive oil, fish and seafood, whole grains, unprocessed fruits and vegetables. Not whatever people are eating nowadays, McDonald's, and whatever else. So over the course of three months, the participants eating the Mediterranean diet reported an improvement in their symptoms, their physical function improved as well, and their sense of vitality also increased. The participants in this intervention group also lost some weight. This is a common observation in a number of these trials, not all of them, but it's pretty frequent. Now, since this type of intervention changes the entire dietary pattern, we can't really tell which food exactly is responsible for the benefits. It could be the omega-3s in the fish. We know omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. It could be the lack of junk food. It could be the fruits and vegetables. It could be the olive oil with the polyphenols. Or it could be the weight loss playing a role as well. Or it could be a combination of several of those. So there are several of these trials published looking at a Mediterranean-style diet in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. There are some on looking at MS as well, multiple sclerosis, and most of these trials find benefit, improved symptoms. Not 100%, I've seen one or two where there's no statistically significant effect, but the majority find some improvement. Next, we'll take a look at trials that use fasting as the intervention. Just a quick note that it might seem odd or interesting to some viewers that the food in our gut affects how our joints feel or even our nervous system in the case of MS. In fact, it's common for patients with rheumatoid arthritis to also have some gastrointestinal issues. And it's also known that patients with RA, rheumatoid arthritis, have some differences in their microbiome compared to healthy people. And these differences have been hypothesized to play a role in triggering RA. We know the composition of our microbiome can affect the integrity of our gut wall what's called the intestinal permeability. And this can allow some molecules present in the gut to get into the gut wall. That can lead to an activation of the immune system locally, or it can even lead to some systemic manifestations affecting other tissues like our joints or our skin. Studies in this field even refer to this concept of the gut-joint axis. Basically, this connection, this bridge between the two worlds. Okay, let's look at fasting interventions. And one example is a trial, also a randomized control trial, where they took patients with rheumatoid arthritis as well, and they put them on a fasting regime for seven to 10 days. It wasn't a 100% fast, it's what they call a subtotal fast. 
So eating a very low amount of calories, specifically two to 300 calories a day, just some tea, some veggie broth, and vegetable juices. And the patients reported a number of improvements. Their pain level, stiffness, joint discomfort, swelling, all reduced. Of course, you can only do an extreme fast like that for so long. At some point, you gotta start reintroducing foods. So that's what they did. They reintroduced foods one by one. Every two days, they would add back a single food. And if the patient tolerated, that food would stay. If they had a reaction, the food would come out again and they would try that same food later on in the process one more time. This reintroduction stage lasted for about a year, so fairly long, and during the first three months, they completely avoided some foods that the investigators thought might be more triggering. So foods containing gluten, meat, fish, eggs, dairy, refined sugars, citrus fruits, coffee, and alcohol. And after the initial three months, for the remainder, for the other nine months, they also tried to reintroduce gluten and dairy. During this reintroduction phase, there was a bit of a rebound. Some of the symptoms bounced back a little bit, but overall, they held on to a substantial improvement over the course of the trial compared to before. They also had a reduction in their inflammatory markers, and there was some body weight loss as well. And the authors ran a statistical analysis and it doesn't look like the weight loss explains most of the effect of the improvement in symptoms. Another really cool thing about this trial is they looked at the microbiome of the participants and the responders, the participants who reported an improvement on the intervention, had a different microbiome composition than the non-responders. So the authors hypothesized that this may mediate the effect. So fasting is another strategy where we see improvements pretty consistently across a number of studies. Next, we'll look at low-fat interventions and a number of studies use it. There's one in patients with rheumatoid arthritis as well, and they report a number of improvements in several symptoms like pain, joint tenderness, and swelling when they were eating a diet with less than 10% of calories coming from fat. Now, this was a single arm study, no control group, so that reduces our confidence a lot. We don't know if the effects or because of the diet specifically, or if it's placebo effect, or just the effect of changing diets, or something about being in the study. There are also a couple trials with low-fat diets in patients with MS, multiple sclerosis, with actual control groups reporting some improvement, less fatigue, and lower risk of relapse. In one trial, the comparison, the control group had no intervention, and the low-fat group saw an improvement. In another trial, the comparison was a higher fat diet, but both were interventions and both improved. So it's possible that it's less about how much fat they're eating and more about just cleaning up the diet, which most interventions tend to do. Another strategy used by some trials is the elemental diet. It's a diet designed to contain all the essential nutrients in their simplest form. So it contains no proteins per se, only the individual amino acids. And that makes it hypoallergenic because the vast majority of allergens are proteins. It also contains some fats and some carbs, all in a simple form, and some vitamins and minerals added. All of this is a liquid solution. So it's a liquid replacement meal, kind of like that soy lent, but also designed to be hypoallergenic. The researchers tested this liquid replacement meal, but they found that most participants didn't tolerate very well just drinking that and eating nothing at all no solid foods. So the design of their trial was a bit of a compromise. The participants got the liquid replacement meal and they were allowed to eat a few foods. Some chicken, fish, rice, carrots, beans, and bananas. And the control group also got the liquid replacement meal on top of their normal diet. So it was a bit of an unusual design. And the participants, all of whom had rheumatoid arthritis, those who were in the intervention group, so that simpler diet, liquid replacement meal, and a few foods, lost some weight, and they reported some improvements to their symptoms, and their grip strength increased as well. After a month of this intervention, they entered a reintroduction phase that lasted a few months. They started adding foods back, but in this trial, food reintroduction eliminated all the improvements. Now, in this trial, they reported something really interesting. 
which specific foods the participants complained triggered symptoms. The most mentioned one was red meat, which is interesting because we have viewers who say this is one of the only foods that doesn't cause problems and that they can tolerate. And there are some surveys of patients in this condition published. So this points to an aspect of individual variability. And we'll circle back to this. Other foods were less surprising, like dairy or cereals, probably because of the lactose and gluten or wheat intolerances. Some people also reported intolerance to vegetables, caffeine, eggs, and a few others. Number three on the list was actually tap water, which I found surprising. So maybe it's the additives like chlorine. So this got me really curious. I didn't read too much into it because the number of patients in this study that reported this list was very small, small sample size. So I looked for larger analyses getting at this type of information. I found one analysis of over 700 patients with autoimmune disease and between 30 and 40% said that food affects their symptoms. Red meat was again, the most common food worsening symptoms and alcohol, coffee, sweets, citrus fruits, and apples were also mentioned. Then I found another analysis that provides even more information because they report both foods that trigger symptoms and foods that help. The most mentioned food that helped was blueberries, then fish, strawberries, and spinach. And on the triggering side, sugary soda was the number one enemy, then desserts, beer, then red meat, and then eggplant, diet soda, and tomatoes. Notice that the percentage is not very high for each food, so many other participants did not report these foods, again pointing to individual variability. Now here's the fascinating part. Every one of these foods had some people reporting improvement and some people reporting worsening. Even the blueberries made things worse for a small number of patients. And even the soda was good for some people. This analysis and this figure I thought were fascinating because this explains a lot about the social media messages that we see around autoimmune disease and nutrition, which tend to be very extreme. Some influencers telling people they have to eliminate all animal products from their diet and it's the only way. Someone else telling them they gotta eliminate all the plants and eat nothing but meat. And this is very confusing for the public. I get a lot of messages, people asking me, what on earth is going on? Is someone lying? No, it's right there in the figure. What probably happened is one person couldn't tolerate red meat and maybe other animal products. As we saw, that's not rare statistically. So of course they're gonna feel better on a vegan diet, on, on an all plant diet. And now they start saying that's the solution for autoimmune disease. And they back rationalize that all animal products are unhealthy for humans. Not supported by the scientific evidence, but that's their personal experience. At the same time, Another guy couldn't tolerate some vegetables or maybe all vegetables and red meat improved his symptoms. So he's in this bar over here. So he starts saying, this is the solution for autoimmune disease. And he back rationalizes, oh, so vegetables are toxic for all humans. Everybody should stop eating them. Not supported by the scientific evidence at all, but that's how it legitimately felt to him. So their audiences are self-selecting I tried this diet, works for me, I line up behind this guru. Doesn't work for me, I tried the other one. That one works, I line up behind this guy. And both are completely convinced the other one's wrong because the diet didn't work for them. Each guru is preaching to the crowd that matches their experience. When we zoom out and we look at a population that's not self-selected, it's not a forum, it's not a diet community on the internet, it's a number of people with the disease that went to a specialist. So it's not selected by diet. We see the big picture. Both intolerances exist. And this is probably a simplified picture as well. There's likely all kinds of gradations and variations. Some people with extreme intolerances can only handle like one food or a couple foods. We have some viewers in that position. And then other people with more partial intolerances can handle a bunch of stuff maybe a couple of foods that are no bueno, and maybe some others that they can eat a little bit, but if they go overboard, they feel it. Now, of course, the role of science and medicine 
is to understand what's going on behind these different intolerances and find some solutions case by case. So we have to believe people when they report these difficulties and not give them a hard time. But of course, we don't extrapolate from a group of people with an intolerance to all of humanity now needs to avoid this food. It's silly. It's not scientifically serious. And it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the people with the intolerance because it doesn't provide a solution. And certainly doesn't help everybody else because they just get a confusing message. All right, that was a long detour, but I think this is important. We'll come back to the individual variability. Right now, let's keep going through other dietary strategies. Another diet I've seen used in some trials is the anti-inflammatory diet. One version of it is used, for example, in the context of IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. They even call it the IBD-8, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, aid anti-inflammatory diet. And IBD aid has five components. The first is reducing some types of carbohydrate, like lactose and refined carbs. The second is supporting the microbiome, trying to restore microbiome health and function. And this is done by providing both prebiotics and probiotics. Prebiotics is essentially food for our microbes. So for example, foods containing soluble fiber, like leeks or onions. And Probiotics means microbial species themselves, alive. So fermented foods is a common way to do that. The third component of IBD aid is fat type, and it favors unsaturated fats over saturated. The fourth component is identifying specific intolerances and addressing them. And the fifth component is modifying texture. So for example, by blending or grinding or cooking foods. The idea is to improve nutrient absorption and also to break down fiber, to kind of chop it up, to make digestion easier for people with this condition and this difficulty processing complex carbohydrates. Some examples of foods in an IBD-8 diet, lean meats, poultry, fish, omega-3 rich eggs, select fruits and vegetables, flowers, mainly non-grain based flowers, and then probiotics, aged cheese, yogurt, kefir, miso, some honey, and then some examples of prebiotics as well, banana, oat, blended chicory root, flax meal. One example of a trial using such a diet in IBD patients had a pretty good result. 60% of patients reported a good or very good response, and many were able to discontinue at least some of their IBD medication. Now, caveat, this trial was not randomized, so grain of salt, but there's a suggestion that IBD aid type diets can help. Another interesting strategy used in some trials is the autoimmune protocol, or AIP. It's a modified paleo diet, so it avoids grains, even whole grains, dairy, eggs, legumes, nightshades, nuts and seeds, alcohol, coffee, oil, and food additives. So basically, ultra-processed foods. That is a lot of restrictions, but this is the elimination phase. Then there is a reintroduction phase later on. Here's an example menu of an AIP autoimmune protocol type diet. One meal is fish with vegetables, another sweet baked potatoes, another beef stew with vegetables, etc. Basically, a lot of whole foods, some meats, some vegetables. There are several studies using AIP, the autoimmune protocol, in patients with IBD, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, and also Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune disease that affects the thyroid gland. The results are pretty encouraging. Symptoms generally improve. Some trials more compelling than others, as always, some single arm, some randomized controlled, but overall, some indication that AIP might be helpful, at least for a subset of patients with autoimmune disease. Next, we'll look at interventions with vegan diets. Obviously, we're summarizing each of these chapters a ton. We're just giving you the juice. But if this is a topic of interest, we can make more content in the future and dive into the details of each diet, for example, and go through the studies one by one, or look at specific autoimmune diseases. Or we can try to bring on specialists, rheumatologists, for example, with a lot of clinical experience and research experience to give us more insight. There are several studies looking at vegan diets, although they usually make other changes as well, like give the participants 
a probiotic drink, a fermented drink, or use a gluten-free vegan diet. So hard to know exactly which factor is crucial for the benefits, but several of these interventions have been shown to improve symptoms of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Now that's average of all participants. So as usual, a lot of individual variability. Some patients report improvements, some no change. We can even find some that are worse off. More patients did not report improvements. That's why the average goes in that direction. But at an individual level, a lot of scatter. There's also some evidence that gluten-free diets may be helpful for patients with psoriasis, which is an autoimmune disease affecting the skin. It's not uncommon for patients with psoriasis to have other immune conditions, including celiac disease. So as we saw before, a lot of links between all this. In fact, gluten-free diets seem particularly helpful for psoriasis patients who also have gluten intolerances or elevation of antibodies against some of the gluten proteins. So the gluten-free diet improves their gastrointestinal symptoms and improves their skin condition as well. Okay, some studies use what's called an elimination diet, basically another restriction diet. No dairy, eggs, meat, fish, sugar, wheat, corn, nuts, citrus fruits, or coffee. And they report improvements in rheumatoid arthritis, like the number of tender joints and inflammatory markers tend to come down. So you can see that there's a number of similarities between these different dietary strategies. There's also some differences. This one, for example, avoids fish, whereas many of the others favor it. So a number of diets show some pretty promising results with some uncertainty, with some open questions. For example, the comparison, the control group is oftentimes no intervention or is just regular diet. So it's possible that the benefits we're seeing are mainly due to just the removal of the standard Western diet. So what about trials comparing two different intervention diets? One study looked at patients with MS and it compared a modified paleo to what's called the Swank diet. It's a diet that favors unsaturated fats and it's high in whole grains and fruits and vegetables. And the modified paleo was six to nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day and six to 12 ounces of meat a day with also some fish and organ meats and no grains, no eggs, most dairy was cut and legumes were also out. Both of those diets improved symptoms. Improvements were reported by 40 to 70% of patients. The primary outcome was fatigue and it was reduced similarly in both diets and then the secondary outcomes were metrics of quality of life and also a walk test. And those were reduced more strongly, were improved more strongly by the modified paleo. I wondered if it was maybe the gluten that got removed, maybe the lactose that's removed as well, or maybe it's the increase in omega-3s. I was looking for information on this, but unfortunately, this trial does not report actual nutrient intakes on the diets, so I couldn't confirm it. Regardless, I think it's an interesting result, a, a bit of a grain of salt as usual, being an isolated trial, but interesting information that I'd like to have if I had MS and I was trying to figure this out. Another trial compared a low-fat diet to a Mediterranean diet in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and again, both diets improved most parameters like pain, quality of life, metrics, etc., with one parameter, physical activity, improving only on the Mediterranean diet. Another trial compared fasting to a low-carb diet. It was this modality we talked about, the subtotal fast, where people are getting about 200 calories a day, and the people in the fasting group had a reduction in inflammatory markers and joint tenderness. The other group ate a normal amount of calories, 2,000 to 2,500 a day, but very low carb. In fact, they were in ketosis. They, both groups were in ketosis, the fasting and the low carb, similar levels of ketone bodies, but the low carb group did not experience the same improvements. So there does seem to be something different about fasting. And in fact, in this trial, in the refeeding stage, after fasting, they added foods back on and the improvements disappeared. Also caveats to this study, there's always some caveat, 
not randomized, and small sample size. There are other trials that indicate that a ketogenic diet can deliver some benefits, like for example, a reduction in morning stiffness in uh, patients with RA, with rheumatoid arthritis. It just seems less effective than fasting over these short time frames. So it might just be a temporal thing. The low carb diet might take a little longer to kick in since fasting is a stronger stimulus. Another trial compared fasting to a Mediterranean diet. And again, fasting came out on top. In fact, in this one, only the fasting group saw significant clinical improvements. And another trial compared a Mediterranean diet to an exercise program. And they found that the exercise had a stronger benefit for rheumatoid arthritis. Next, we're gonna quickly go over evidence for supplements in autoimmune disease. And there is some evidence that omega-3 supplementation can help in rheumatoid arthritis. And again, we know that omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, so it makes sense. Most studies used fish oil, and there's evidence of some benefit starting around a gram of EPA DHA per day, and then stronger benefit at even higher doses of two grams a day, and even higher, up to six grams a day. Also some evidence for vitamin D supplementation in rheumatoid arthritis mainly in patients who have low levels of vitamin D to begin with. So this may be mainly rectifying low vitamin D. A couple other things have some evidence suggesting benefit, more sparse, like one trial for each, but just so you have all of the info, borage, seed oil, I saw at least one trial where people getting 1.4 grams of gamma linolenic acid from borage seed oil improved rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. And I don't sell any of these supplements. I don't have a deal with supplement companies. Just sharing what's published. Another trial indicates that black currant seed oil, 10.5 grams a day, can help with rheumatoid arthritis as well. And then a couple of probiotics, lactobacillus casei 01, a capsule with 10 to the 8th power colony forming units, CFUs per day. This is just a measure of how many bacteria are in the supplement, in the capsule. Another one, lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. In one trial, people got capsules with at least five times 10 to the ninth power CFUs per capsule. So that's 5 billion bacteria. That's what that number means. And that's per capsule. And they took four capsules a day. So 20 billion CFUs a day. And finally, ashwagandha extract. There is a trial Technically not an autoimmune disease, but patients with knee pain, the trial lasted for 12 weeks and the patients got either 125 milligrams or 250 milligram supplements twice a day. And both doses reduced symptoms with the larger dose having a stronger effect. So that's the information on supplements. Now, I wanted to give you some final thoughts on this individual variability. We see promising data for a lot of different dietary patterns. We see people reporting improvements on widely different diets. What's going on here? One common theme is weight loss, which is common in a lot of these trials and in most elimination diets. And we know that weight loss is a powerful anti-inflammatory stimulus. So it probably does play a role. It's a factor. Does it explain all the observations? I don't think so. There are some trials without weight loss reporting clinical improvement. And some people have intolerance to single foods within a matter of days of eating it. So that can't all be explained by putting on a bunch of weight. Another common theme is ultra processed foods, junk food. All of these elimination diets reduce it or get rid of it. And we know that cutting out ultra processed foods helps people lose weight, probably improves the microbiome, and it gets rid of a lot of preservatives and additives that can trigger reactions. So I think junk food is a factor. Again, I don't think it explains everything because as we saw, some people have intolerance to some whole foods as well. So it's pretty clear that there are specific types of allergies and intolerances. Some people can't handle gluten, others dairy, others red meat, and others some types of fiber. Can these intolerances be reversed? That's the million dollar question, the billion dollar question. So I've seen two interesting ideas that may help us move in that direction. And this part is more speculative. We're just kind of thinking out loud, which is okay to do as long as we're 
clear that that's what we're doing. The first idea is that some intolerances are reversible via gradual, careful reintroduction of problem foods. Reintroduction is a pretty standard procedure in gastroenterology in the context of some of these gastrointestinal conditions. And I've seen it work very powerfully. This might be related to microbiome deficiencies. We know that Westerners tend to have low microbiome diversity, whether it's the exposure to the standard Western diet with a lot of junk foods and low fiber, or whether it's the antibiotic exposure or infections like food poisoning, all of these things can really rock our microbiome. So carefully ramping up these problematic foods can in some cases restore tolerance, possibly by cultivating the right microbial species back up in our gut. So they might be impoverished and feeding them the right foods might allow them to grow back up. Note of caution here, I am not saying that if you have an allergy to soy or peanuts or seafood, that you should go cram those foods to get tolerance. All right, please don't do that. This is very case by case. Ideally, work with your doctor or with a good qualified registered dietitian. The other idea is fermented foods. There is some evidence that people who have difficulty breaking down some foods like high fiber foods, for example, experience improvements when they're given fermented foods. And again, this might be because the probiotics restore the defective microbiome species. So for viewers who have autoimmune diseases, I'd be very interested to hear if you've tried fermented foods and what was the result. We covered this idea of the fermented foods in a previous video, so check that out for details. And here's more on food reintroduction and gut issues. And let me know in the comments what other questions you'd like to see covered next on this topic. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Thank you.